The rules for achieving financial independence are simple. The rules are as follows. Rule number one. Spend less than you earn, and then save or invest the difference. This has always been the case. It's the key to financial success going back to The Richest Man in Babylon by George S. Clayson more than 2,000 years ago. You can be working an average job, whether it's at a gas station, on a farm, or driving a truck. But if you save $100 a month on average from age 20 to age 65 and let it accumulate, you'll be worth more than a million. $100 a month, $25 a week, or less than $4 a day. That's about the same amount as buying a latte at Starbucks. Can you do that? Okay, well, do lots of other things, but do that for sure. Now, rule number two for achieving financial independence is that 10% of every dollar you earn is yours to keep. What this means is that you need to develop a habit from the beginning of your career of cutting 10% off the top of your salary and living on the other 90%. Most people get their paycheck and they spend most of it. If there's anything left over, they throw it in the bank temporarily and then they grab it out and spend it on something else. They look at their bank account and shout, gee, we've got money here, let's burn it. Some people have just got to get rid of the money. Rule number three is to resolve in advance to prefer financial independence to status. The work in The Millionaire Next Door found that the mark of self-made millionaires is that they weren't concerned about impressing the neighbors or keeping up with the Joneses. They were more concerned with financial independence. So, say to yourself, financial independence is number one to me, and status is number two, three, four, or ten. And be willing to stick to it. It's absolutely amazing what will happen to you financially. Do you know what we found out about self-made millionaires? They never buy new cars. Why? Because in a new car, there's several thousand dollars of depreciation that's money that you lose the minute you drive it off the lot. So, what self-made millionaires do, based on interviews with thousands of them, is they pick a car they really like, they follow it in Consumer Reports and JD Power for quality and service, and then about two to three years out, they look for used models with low mileage and good service records, and then they buy a car that 20 to 25% in depreciation has already been taken out of. I've worked with a man once who started with nothing and achieved a net worth of $800 million. Now, he lived in a nice normal neighborhood, you know, with doctors, lawyers, and architects, but not ostentatious. But the people living on either side of him were just two paychecks away from homelessness. If their income was cut off for two months, they wouldn't be able to make their mortgage payments. I watched this guy. He drove the same used car for three or four years. He liked Cadillacs. He'd get a nice Cadillac, take good care of it, and then he'd get another used or a newer vehicle from a dealership, so that it had already been depreciated. He was never ostentatious at all, and he ended up one of the richest men in America. When you met him, he'd be wearing an old sweater. He didn't have a huge wardrobe or the same suits to meetings, and he had no bills at all. But when he wanted to go somewhere, he'd fly in his private $25 million jet all by himself. Now back to the last rule for achieving financial independence. Rule number four is once you put the money away, never touch it. This is important. So if you're writing it down, write it in red. You see, many of us make the mistake of thinking that if you save money, you put that money away so you can have it. It's fun money. So when you decide, I want to buy a car, or I want to go on a trip, or I want a boat, you go and you get this money that you saved. However, if you want to spend money on those things, set up a separate savings account. This money is for your financial security. This is your financial freedom fund. Once you put money into this financial freedom account, you lock it in like a one-way door. It goes in and it never comes out. You never spend it. I can tell you all kinds of stories about how this will change your life, including in my life. But please believe me, once you put it away and decide that you will never spend it, as far as you're concerned, it's gone forever. I personally will do whatever is necessary, no matter what my financial emergency is, to not touch my financial fortress. Never touch it, because if you even think, even a tiny glimmer that you can get it if you need it, then you'll find yourself needing it at the first opportunity. So the key to financial success is, pay yourself first. Save 10% of your income, buy used things rather than new, and once you put money away, never, never touch it. Put it away and let it stay there until it accumulates and enables you to do anything you want in life. Today in America, it's a little different because of the state of the economy. And of course you bought low and sold high, but very few of us did that. 10 to 20% per year after taxes and expenses in terms of growing your net worth is a pretty good goal. 
and it's ultimately achievable. So, write down five figures representing your target net worth over the next five years. It seems remarkable, but the fact is that the starting point of increasing your income or your net worth is very simple. Can you guess what it is? Decide to do it. Make a decision to become financially independent. You say, well, it's not that simple. Well, it is that simple. It's just not easy. Easy, but it is simple. The primary reason that people don't succeed in life or finances is because they never decide to and then back up that decision with determination. Now, there are a lot of things you can do after you've made a decision, but there are very few things you can do before making a decision or without making a decision. So, make that decision. Your decision may be wrong or it may be inaccurate, but at least it's a great starting point. It's like drawing a line in the ground that you step over. What if I don't get it by such and such a date? Don't worry about it. At least get it on paper and take the first step. Once upon a time when I started my career, I sat down at the end of the year, and my tax returns were $14,400. Twelve years later, I sat down and did my tax returns, and my tax returns were $1,440,000. I'd increased my income by a hundred times in 12 years. And I went back and I started to look at that, and I realized that I used a formula, which I gradually articulated into what I call the 1% formula. It's very simple. It's based on the law of incremental improvement. Japanese call it the Kaizen principle. The principle of continuous betterment. It's getting a little bit better every day. So I asked the question, if you could increase your productivity, performance and output by one-tenth of one percent per day, could you do that? Could you increase your productivity, performance and output by one thousandth in a day? And the answer is, of course. If you're even the tiniest bit more efficient, or you worked a little bit harder on a more important task, you could become a tenth of a percent better in a day. Well, if you did that every single day for a week, it would be one-tenth of one percent times five. You'd be one-half of one percent more productive in a week. Is that possible? Of course you would say, anybody can become that small amount more productive. So, I said, if you did that every week for four weeks, you'd be 2% more productive over the course of a month. If you did that every day for 52 weeks in a year, you'd be 26% more productive. Is that possible? And the answer is yes. Because there is a thing at success called the momentum principle. That means that once you start going, it becomes easier and easier to keep going and to go faster and faster. So. Once you become 26% more productive in the course of a year, your overall output, your results, your income will go up by 26%. What happens is you start to get into the swing of it. You start to be more effective, more efficient. You get more things done. You start earlier, you work harder, you stay later, you set better priorities, and so on. So, if you do this 26% each year for 10 years, you will be 104% better. And this is what happened to me. And it's happened to every single person I've ever worked with. Not long ago I was in Seattle, and this young man came up to me. He's about 30. I met him when he was about 22. He was working in a used car lot in a small town outside of Portland. His name is Chris. And he came up and said, Mr. Tracy, do you remember me? I said, Yes Chris of course. Nice guy, great personality. He said, Well, you know the 1% formula that you taught me many years ago? I said, Yes, I remember because I've taught it to so many people. He said, Brian, it doesn't work. I said, it doesn't work? He said, it doesn't work. I said, how do you mean? He smiled and said, it doesn't take 10 years. It only took me seven. He said today he's earning 10 times what he was earning seven years ago. He said, I used it every day. It's absolutely amazing. I'm making more money today in a week or a month than I was often making in a month or a year by using that formula. What I did personally is I used it once, increased my income 10 times, and then I used it again, and increased my income 10 times more, 100 times in 12 years. And so can you. There are two great principles of wealth attainment, and they're both equally important to understand and implement in order to be successful and acquire wealth. The first principle of wealth creation is to make compound interest work in your favor. Einstein said that compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe. Get that money in there and get it working for you. Peter Lynch of Mellon said that it's not timing the market that makes you rich. It's time in the market that makes you rich. Remember, 
If you invested $1 at 3% at the time of Christ, you'd be worth all the money in the world today with compound interest. Compound interest is phenomenal. So, make it work in your favor by getting the money in there early and leaving it there to work. The second principle of wealth creation is to use dollar cost averaging. When you buy stocks, don't worry about being right every time or getting the lowest price when you buy. It doesn't really matter, unless of course stocks are overpriced at the end of a boom. But if you invest a steady amount of money every week, or every month or every year, then you'll end up buying things at the average price. The prices will go up and down, but you'll end up buying them high, buying them low, buying them average, and over time, you'll get the very best average deal. Dollar cost averaging is one of the great techniques for financial success. Here's an example of dollar cost averaging. Investing steady, 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 year after year. I have a good friend who came over here as an immigrant at the age of 17, couldn't even speak English. So, he began to learn English, and when he was 20 years old, he could speak enough English to begin studying financial success and going to college. Well, I had dinner with him not long ago. He had a four-acre property and a 16,000-square-foot home in a beautiful community on the East Coast. He's worth millions of dollars today. He owns banks, shopping centers, and national corporations. Here's what happened. When he was 20, someone told him that real estate is the key to financial success. They're not making any more of it. You should own real estate. Well, he never thought about that, and at that time, he was a student and didn't have very much money, but he was working evenings and weekends to pay for his needs, which is what they used to do in those days. So he decided he would buy one piece of property each year. His first piece of property was in a small community outside of town, and it was a lot, and it cost $25 a month to service it. He had the sweat to make those monthly payments. But his goal was to buy one piece of property a year, and he kept on doing it. He's now 49 years old, and the last piece of property he bought last year was a $225 million shopping center. He still buys one property a year, only now they're much, much bigger. The skill and experience and discipline that he developed over time in buying those properties, which got bigger and bigger, made him a millionaire, and then a multi-millionaire. So, what's your excuse? What's our excuse? We're surrounded by hundreds, thousands, even millions of these stories. What is our excuse? It's always one thing. Lack of discipline. So, remember the two great principles of wealth creation. Making compound interest work for you by getting the money in there and working and using dollar cost averaging, whether it's buying stocks or real estate. Next is maximize. Determine your special talents, abilities and strengths, and focus on developing them to a higher level. Then multiply. Leverage yourself and your business with other people's customers, other people's knowledge, other people's abilities, other people's efforts, other people's money, and other people's resources. Now you've heard the old saying, it takes money to make money. Yes, that's true. But it doesn't have to be your money. It can be somebody else's money. While successful people have developed the ability to call on the money of others. Why? It's because they do good work, and they do good planning, and they take good care of their money, and people line up to give them money. There's now trillions of dollars of money waiting. I have a good friend, one of my business partners, mostly a multimillionaire, started with nothing, and he's worth tens of millions of dollars. He's sitting on a pool of money that he keeps at very low levels of interest. He said, I can't find a place to put it, and I will not put it until I find a place. If somebody could come along with any kind of a business proposition where the person has credibility and a track record and has a good business proposition, there's more money available than you can dream of. The money is there in torrents, like tsunamis of money that are available. That's why you're reading the paper. You read that such and such company just paid 18 billion or 26 billion or Google just offered Groupon $6 billion cash for their business. There's lots of money for good business ideas, but it doesn't have to be your money. It can be somebody else's money. And your ability to attract that money and to justify it is really important. Strategic planning is an essential part of the success formula. Your ability to create a clear and organized strategic plan will largely contribute to your success and wealth. In fact, it's virtually impossible to succeed greatly unless you have a clear idea of where you're going and how to get there. So, here are three key factors to remember when devising a strategic plan. Number one, you are in business for yourself. This means that everything that is ever going to happen to your personal success or corporation, your personal business, is up to you. 
No one else can be expected to do it for you. Now here's a perverse law. The more that you accept that you are responsible for doing whatever it is, the more others will line up to help you. So therefore you say these words, if it's to be, it's up to me. Number two, your aim in strategic planning is to increase your return on energy. Why call this ROE, return on energy? The purpose of strategic planning in business is to increase return on equity, return on capital working in the organization. But your capital is mental, emotional, and human. Your job is to get the most out of your mental, emotional, and intellectual capital. Your job is to get the highest return on energy. My friend Ken Blanchard says you want to get the highest return on the amount of your life invested in your work. Number 3. Successful individuals also have good personal strategic plans. Because a good strategic plan assures that you will get the highest return on the amount of energy that you invest in anything you do. A positive attitude is like a chicken and egg thing. If you're successful, you're positive. If you're positive, you're successful. Which comes first? It doesn't really matter. Positive thinkers are men and women who accomplish an awful lot more than people who have negative mental attitudes. Your job is to become thoroughly positive and constructive towards yourself, your possibilities, the world around you, and the people in your life. The way you do this is very much the same way you develop physical fitness. We know that you can't see the results of mental fitness in the same way you can see physical fitness, but you can see the results of it. Mental fitness comes from following a specific exercise program, doing things in a certain way every single day. It's much easier than going to a gym and sweating and working out. So I'm going to ask you to do this for me. I'm going to give you seven steps, seven things that you can do, seven things that have been proven to work. What I'm going to ask you to do is practice these seven steps for 21 days. The reason for this is that it takes 21 days to develop a new habit pattern of any kind. If you work on a habit pattern and practice it every day, you begin to develop new neural grooves in your brain that cause you to think and act more optimistically automatically. You wake up in the morning feeling better, more positive toward the challenges you face during the day. You become more optimistic in the face of adversity, start to become a more confident and optimistic person. When you do, you'll find your whole life opening up around you like sunshine on a bright morning. This is the great rule of success. Number one is positive self-talk. Positive self-talk has been getting very good press in the last little while. Positive self-talk means that you talk to yourself and make sure that your thoughts are on what you want and off of the things that you don't want. Successful people, positive people, are people who explain things to themselves in a positive way. They say, well, that's an interesting situation, or that'll work out okay, or don't worry about it. The second part of positive self-talk is to control your inner dialogue, to control what's happening inside you, and to be aware that the average person, if they're not careful, will have a tendency to be negative. Remember, 95% of your feelings are determined by the way you talk to yourself. It's absolutely essential that you talk to yourself the way that you want to be. Outside, what you see in your relationships, your health, your work, your customers and so on, tend to be a result of the pictures you have inside. If you see yourself and think about yourself as an extraordinary person, if you see yourself as a success, if you see yourself as happy and positive, confident and in control, if you see yourself as a loving parent or spouse, you will act that way toward others. Your subconscious mind controls your reticular activating system or your reticular cortex as well. If you interview successful people, it's a very interesting thing. If you interview successful people and you ask them on a regular basis, what do you think about? What are you thinking about now? You find that successful people are always thinking constructive, positive, creative thoughts that help them to be more successful. Now, if you think about positive, constructive, success-oriented, happy things, you start to have more of those in your life. The fourth part of mental programming, the fourth part, is positive people. We have a tendency to adopt the words, the actions, the behaviors, the mannerisms, the dress of the people we associate with most of the time, if we're not very careful. Get away from negative people, get around positive people, associate with winners in your life. The fifth part is positive training and development. Most of your success is going to come from other people. Most of your success is going to come from someone who helps you. And people like to help other people who are good at what they do and who are pleasant and easy to get along with. Wait an hour a day. 30 to 60 minutes every day will make you one of the greatest authorities in your field in a couple of years. 
Listen to educational and uplifting audio cassettes in your car. When all knowledge and skills are becoming obsolete, it's the ability to learn new things at a rapid rate. So, dedicate yourself to lifelong continuous personal improvement. Number six is positive health habits. First of all, eat lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, lots of whole grain products. Second of all, stop eating fats, sugars, and salts. Third of all, drink lots of water. And fourth of all, get lots of exercise. Lock, head on to an aerobic exercise program. Regular rest and recreation are absolutely critical to having high levels of physical energy, which gives you the optimism and confidence to be able to bounce when you face the adversities of daily life, rather than breaking. The seventh key to mental fitness, we call this a sense of urgency. There are many qualities that you can develop to be successful, but a sense of urgency is possessed by less than 2% of the population. These are the people who are almost magnets for opportunities. I had to change my thinking. I had to change my philosophy. I'm telling you, my life exploded into change. My bank account changed immediately. My income changed immediately. With a little consideration of the refinement of your sale, by setting a better sale, refining your philosophy, your whole life can start to change from the day on. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. You don't have to wait till next month to start this whole process immediately. Now some people do so little thinking they don't even have their sale up. Now is the chance to change. Number one is velocity. My personal opinion, each person's personal philosophy, here's the definition of success and failure. Sometimes the first year, you say, well, you know, I'm so healthy now. What difference is it going to make? You've got to be smarter than that. Just because disaster doesn't fall on us at the end of the first day, doesn't mean disaster isn't coming. You've got to be so smart that you look down the road and say, well, the errors in my present judgment or philosophy, what's that going to cost me in one year, six years, one month, six months? I'm telling you, the money cost and the health cost and the success cost is too gigantic if you look down the road a little ways and say, are there errors in my current judgment? Like an apple versus a Hershey bar? Is that just a good illustration of some of the rest of my errors in judgment? If it is, that's where I found myself at age 25. At the end of the first six years of my economic life, I've got pennies in my pocket. I've got nothing in the bank. The creditors are calling, saying, Hey, you told us the check was in the mail. I'm embarrassed. I'm behind on my promise. I used to think it was the community that was messed up. And the country was messed up. The government was messed up. Then I found out what was really messed up was my own personal philosophy. My own errors in judgment in my own personal philosophy brought me, in six years, pennies in my pocket, nothing in the bank, and trying to explain why I wasn't doing well living in America as a 25-year-old American male with a family. Every reason to do well here. Here's the formula for failure. Errors in judgment being lax about developing your own personal philosophy. Come on now. Let me give you the secret to success. The formula for failure, a few errors in judgment repeated every day for one month starts the weakness, starts the disaster process. You can imagine what happened. Now here's the formula for success. A few simple disciplined practices every day, and you've started the whole new process called a whole new life. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. It's not only with your health habits, but with your money habits, and with your communication habits with your sales habits, management habits, and every other habit that you've got. If you'll start that process, eliminate the errors, and replace it with disciplined practice, you can start this process of life change immediately after today. You don't ever have to be the same again. You don't have to start with something staggering. What if you should be walking around the block for your good health, and you don't? What did that do in six years? I'm telling you, the word is disaster. You could and you should, and you don't. Here's an even stronger word. You won't. I mean don't might mean you're careless. Won't probably means you're stubborn. And either one's called disaster. Now how do you change all that the next six years? By the time I'm 31 I'm a millionaire. How about that? Well, strangely enough, during that second six years of my economic life, the economy was about the same, and prices were about the same, and everything else was about the same. Circumstances were about the same. Then how come I got rich? How come I totally changed my life? I was not the same. I started with my philosophy. I started amending my errors by doing some better thinking, changing my mind, 
coming up with ideas that I didn't have before I met my teacher. And once that whole process started for me, I'm telling you, I changed my whole life within a six-year period. I was never the same, and I've kept up that process all these years. Your philosophy is going to determine whether or not you go for the disciplines or continue the errors. That's called potential. Everybody has it within their view. God didn't say, hey, as simple as an apple a day, as simple as a walk around the block. Why not start right there? If you don't start there, where else are you going to start? Might as well start where it's easy, then go to the more complicated. Because if you can't handle the complicated, the simple disciplines, how can you handle the complicated? Thank you. Hold on. Here's number two. Number one, we're affected by philosophy first. Major of the five major pieces. Number two is attitude. We're affected by how we feel first. We're affected by what we know, decisions we make second. We're affected by attitude, how we feel. It's how you feel about the past. Gotta have a good attitude about the past. Let the past be a schoolmaster to teach you, not to threaten you, but to teach you. Next, it's how you feel about the future. Goal setting. The promise of the future has an awesome effect on your life every day. Without a future well designed, we take hesitant steps. You know, do you have to have hesitant steps for six years? You can have driven into a corner, not boldly willing to go and take your portion, take your share. Next, it's how you feel about everybody else. Gotta have a good attitude about everybody else because it takes everybody else to make a market. And here's the last one. That's how you feel about yourself. Understanding self-worth is the beginning. Self-worth should be easy. If one of us can do it, all of us can. If anybody can think it, we all think it. I can read, you can read. I can understand, you can understand. From where I came from, a few simple things I didn't try revolutionize my life in five years. Is there anybody here that can't do it? Change from pennies to fortune, change from betting to something, change from broke to rich. That's the attitude about yourself. So valuable. Okay, now in transforming our lives, we don't start with attitude. We don't start with inspiration. We start with education. Life change starts with education. You've got to be educated to the point of where you might have messed up. And all you've got to do is write down through the list. You don't need some teacher to come by and tell you, be your own best teacher, saying, hey, let me make a list of some places I've messed up. Because if you let this down, let this down, that probably affects the rest. And the answer is that's true. So, we don't start with inspiration, we start with education. What's the first education? If it isn't going well and you live in America, you have foreign countries. You say, well the country's messed up. That's like cursing the soil and cursing the seed and the sunshine and the rain, which is all you've got. Don't curse the soil. You get your own planet. You can rearrange this whole deal. This one you've got to take like it comes. So number two is attitude. Here was number three. Activity. This is the work part, the labor part, taking action. The activity is the miracle working piece. Miracle being something we don't quite understand how it works, doesn't mean it doesn't work if you're willing to straighten it out. Here's one of the keys. It's called activity. It's called disciplines. Turning wisdom from your philosophy and inspiration. Strengthening of attitude and faith. Courage. Commitment. All this stuff that comes from attitude. If you're willing to take these two qualities, philosophy and attitude, and invest them into activity, you can have a miracle. Anything short of that, no miracle. Wisdom doesn't perform a miracle. Attitude doesn't perform a miracle. The only thing that performs a miracle of increase is called equity. It's called putting wisdom and attitude into disciplined labor. This labor now can perform a miracle. And here are the two parts of the labor. One, do what you can. Number two, do the best you can. Can't give you better advice than that. Number one, do what you can. You just gotta go home and make a list after today. And here's the question to ask as you make this personal list. What am I not doing that would be easy to do? That could greatly change my health? My wealth? What am I not doing? I'm neglecting it. Would be easy to do. If you'll take care of your part, called putting it into activity, action works miracles. But here's how you get a miracle going for your life. Number one, do what you can. Get a list of the stuff you could do and you haven't done postpone, and start cleaning that up. You can't start at a better place for personal change. 
It'll affect your bank account. Affect your future. Affect your income. Affect everything. You can't start a better life change process than cleaning up what you should be doing. The man says, Well, my mother lives down in Florida. I should have written her six months ago. I just can't seem to get that letter written. I'm asking you to get that letter in, clean that up. And don't walk like other people walk. Don't postpone like other people postpone. You say, well, is it as simple as writing a letter? And the answer is yes. Where else would you start for life change, personal change? You don't need a big package to fall out of the sky. You don't need massive bombardment, pre-conscious, subconscious, practice channeling. Find a 2,000-year-old guru. I mean, you don't need any of that stuff. Pass on all that. Kids are afraid of that stuff. Too much of it. You'll be out on a limb with Shirley. I mean, no, pass on all this stuff. This stuff's too easy. This stuff's too simple. It's called taking action. Number one, correct neglect. Correct errors and discipline. Number two, start setting up some disciplines. And if you'll do that, you'll perform a miracle. Now here's the second part of the miracle. Number one is do what you can. Here's number two, do the best you can. If that's not your philosophy, it ought to be amended. The guy slips in late. Company doesn't seem to mind. Flips out early. First one in the parking lot. Heading for happy hour. Stretches his break. Comes early for lunch. Laid back from lunch. Company doesn't seem to notice. Guy says, Best as I can calculate. I'm putting in about a half a day's work, and I'm collecting a full day's pay. And the guy says, I got it made. Little does he know. The seeds of his own disaster are already being sown by the weakness of his own personal philosophy. It's not the economy that's going to determine your next six years. It's your philosophy about labor, about activity, about miracle, about soil and seed, sunshine and rain, the economy, the banks, the money, the companies, the schools, and what's going on. It's your philosophy, and your attitude, and then your ability to take action, all of that we call the process of life change. Miracle working. Here was number four. Results. Every once in a while, you've got to take a measure to see how you're doing with these three pieces. Philosophy, attitude, activity. Now we take a measure called results. What are the results at the end of the day, the results at the end of the week? You can't let too much time go by without checking. When time goes by six years, I've been out there working. When I met my teacher, Mr. Shof, he said, Well, Mr. Ron, let's just go through a little summary here. He said, In the last six years, how much money have you saved and invested? Let's go through a little tab list here. How much money have you saved and invested in the last six years? I said, What? Zero. He said, You have messed up. You remember these notes? I like that. Messed up. He said, who sold you on that plan? I thought, my gosh, the man's right. I'm a nice guy. I bought the wrong plan. What if you were 50 and broke, right? Didn't need to change countries, bought the wrong plan. What a sad scenario that would be. Shof said, these questions, let's go through some results. He said, how many books have you read in the last 90 days? I said, what? Zero. Wisdom of the world available. Change your life change your future. Wisdom of the world available. Develop any skill you want. Earn the kind of income you want. Have all the treasures you want. Relationships with your family that you want. Everything that you want available. And the wisdom of the world to help you get it. Haven't read any books in the last 90 days. My teacher said, Mr. Ron, you have messed up, I'm telling you. You've got the deal. Chov said, Mr. Ron, in the last six months, how many classes have you taken to improve your skills or to develop new skills? Go for the American dream. Become rich and powerful and sophisticated and healthy and influential. How many classes have you taken in the last six months? I said, how many? Zero. He said, you have messed up. Said, you don't need to unmask the country. You don't need to straighten out the perplexed. You don't need to straighten out any of this stuff. All you've got to do is look within and let results teach you a great deal about your own activity, your own attitude, and your own philosophy. I went through that process. Here's all life asks us to do. Make measurable progress in reasonable time. Some things you've got to check every day. Some things you've got to check at least by the end of the week. A salesman joins us at a little sales company, supposed to make 10 calls the first week. Wouldn't it be legitimate, 
calling in on Friday and say, John, how many calls? I mean, this stuff is simple. John says, well, say, John, well, won't fit in this little box here. Well, now John starts with the story. You say, John, I made this little box so small so a story won't fit. I don't need a story. I need what? A number. What will the number tell me? Everything. John's supposed to make 10 calls. What if he made 20? You'd say, wow. What if he only made one call? Will that tell us something about John's philosophy? And the answer is yes. Will it tell us something about his attitude? Of course. Will it tell us something about his disciplines? Of course. And if he wants a lesson in life change, all he has to do is be willing to face the numbers and come up with the results that will teach you to either celebrate if you've got good results or fix whatever needs to be fixed in your philosophy, attitude and activity called disciplines. You don't need to go anywhere else. I do believe in affirmations. Now, if you need a little additional affirmation, you just put up there on 40 and broke. I mean, you know, that ought to do it. And if you need just a little more, put up there, I live in America, and I'm 40 and broke. That's enough to turn your life around. It says, hey, something is wrong somewhere, I have messed up. And I'm telling you, if you'll start with that, it's called the process of life change. And it doesn't matter how small the process is to start, one discipline starts it, and then one discipline feeds another, feeds another, and the first thing you know, you've got this whole cycle in an upward positive motion. It's called life change, called income change, it's called health change, relationship with your family change, equities unprecedented that you can have in numbers that will stagger the imagination. If you do not curse what's available and start amending what's possible to get the results that you want, anybody can do this stuff. Results are the name of the game. Success is a numbers game. Good note to me. Said that it's a numbers game. You've got to go for the number. You've got to understand what the numbers are. Today, what I want to do is show you how to get on top of your financial house. I want you to be standing there, but it's going to take a few years. It's not going to be quick. If you're looking for a get-rich-quick scheme, you're in the wrong room. Now how do you get on top of your financial house? In Tennessee, if we want to get up on top of a house, we use a ladder, and ladders have steps. There are rules about using these steps. If you climb up and the ladder starts to move, if you're over 16 that is, you come back down, steady the ladder, and try again. You repeat the steps, but you take them slow and gradual. You don't skip steps because that's how you end up hanging upside down with a broken leg, making your neighbor laugh. No skipping steps. Be willing to come back down to solid ground and repeat the process. These are the rules for using a ladder. Around our place, we call these steps baby steps. And you don't move to baby step 4 until you've completed baby step 1. There's a process here, and there's a reason for it. You have to lay a solid foundation. When building a house, you don't start with the crown molding before you've even put up the drywall or built the structure on a solid foundation. We start with baby step 1. Before doing anything else, set up a $1,000 starter emergency fund. Get this $1,000 as fast as you can. That's not your full emergency fund. That's your starter. I want you to gather 10 Benjamin Franklins, quickly, right now, fast. This is the easiest baby step because it's only $1,000, and it's the one you'll complete the fastest. In many cases though, this is the hardest step, because this is the point where you decide whether you're really going to change your life. Are you really going to buy into this process? Are you really going to do what others have successfully done? Are you truly ready to engage in this process, or will you continue doing things haphazardly as you've been doing? It's time to get serious. Get focused. This thing is going to change because here's the problem. We humans don't like change. We tend to do the same thing over and over again. Some of us work in jobs we've hated every day for 15 years, and the only reason we don't change is that we don't like change. Even if what we're doing isn't working, we defend it. We fight for our right to be foolish. We get stuck in our ways, like a toddler in a dirty diaper. We know it smells bad, but it's warm, and it's ours. If you want to succeed in life, you have to learn to embrace change because the only constant in life is change itself. Embrace it, especially when it comes to managing your money. You start with $1,000 in the bank, and then you learn to save money, something nobody really does. Everyone talks about it, everyone agrees it's wise, but nobody does it. You're walking around in the richest country the world has ever known, and yet all the money leaves your house every month. You have to make saving money a philosophical, theological, spiritual, emotional, relational, and mathematical process. 
I'm sick of being broke. After 20 years of doing budgets, I do know something about it. I know it's tough. I know it's hard. But so is being broke. What we're starting here is the first step of savings, the emergency fund. Grandma always said to save for a rainy day. According to Money Magazine, 78% of Americans will face a major negative financial event in any given 10-year period. You better be ready because it's coming. You need to save money for emergencies because you're an emergency looking for a place to happen. If you haven't faced a financial setback of $5,000 to $7,000 in the last few years, statistically, you're overdue. It's coming. Get ready. You need to build your emergency fund. You need to be positive. I'm positive it's going to rain. Get yourself an emergency fund. That's how this stuff works. You don't even have to put it in the bank. One lady framed her $1,000 and put it in an 8x10 picture frame from Walmart. She named it and wrote, In case of emergency, break glass underneath. Just make sure it's not too easy to access, but accessible if needed. Get that minimum starter emergency fund ready to go. Personal finances are 80% behavior. It's only 20% head knowledge. You've got to change what you're doing to get a different result. You can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different outcome. The 12 steppers call that the definition of insanity. Baby step two, the debt snowball. Pay off all your debt except your home using the debt snowball method. List your debts smallest to largest. Pay minimum payments on everything but the smallest one and attack it with a vengeance. Once it's paid off, take that payment and any extra money you can squeeze out of your budget and attack the next one. Keep rolling over the snowball, picking up more snow each time until you reach your largest debt, except your home. Typically, this is a student loan or a car payment. When you're paying $1,500 to $2,000 a month on a $10,000 debt, it disappears quickly. Yes, it would be mathematically proper to pay off the highest interest rate debt first. But this is about behavior modification, not math. When you go on a diet, losing weight in the first week keeps you motivated to continue. You want to see results for your effort? Knocking off debts one by one builds belief, faith, and intensity. You have to get to a point where you say, I've had it. I'm sick of this. That's when you change your life. You can't wander into debt, but you can't wander out. You need that moment where you say, that's it. I'm tired of working my butt off and having nothing to show for it but an empty payment book. But I promise you it works. If you keep doing it, you'll get to chase the cheetah. Now you won't have any payments but a house payment. We're now at baby step two. We've reached the 18 to 24 month mark, which feels pretty good. Our next goal is to continue with gazelle intensity and focus on building up that $1,000 account until it reaches a fully funded emergency fund, which is three to six months of expenses. Emergency funds should be easy to access or liquid. Put them in a money market type account with your mutual fund company and have check writing privileges. It's not going to earn much interest, but that's not the point. I want you to put three to six months of expenses in there. For some of you, that may be $10,000, $15,000, or even $20,000 just sitting there, boring but ready for life to happen. Here's the deal. Your emergency fund is not an investment, it's insurance. Investments make you money, but insurance costs you money to protect your money. You buy insurance to protect your house, your health, or to replace your income if something happens to you. Your emergency fund is there to protect your investments. If you dip into your 401k because you don't have an emergency fund, you'll end up losing half of it in penalties and taxes. That's why it's essential to have an emergency fund. I've been there. I didn't have an emergency fund when I was a millionaire doing real estate. Everything went back into the deals, and we had no liquidity. That lack of wiggle room is one reason I face challenges. An emergency fund puts a buffer between you and Murphy's Law. If something can go wrong, it will. Without an emergency fund, Murphy will move in with his three cousins, broke, desperate, and stupid, turning your life into a country song. So, don't put your emergency fund in a certificate of deposit, because if you cash it out early, they charge a penalty. Instead, use a simple money market account with your mutual fund company, where you can easily access your funds. Some may find emergency funds boring or not sophisticated enough, but they're the most crucial key to our financial plan, guys. If you want to make one of the best investments you'll ever make in your life, listen to her. She's wired by God to be naturally smarter than you on this subject. Her nature takes her to a place of calm and security in this area. 
This emergency fund causes her to relax in a place you don't even have when you do the investment and the work and the budgeting to participate in the process. When this emergency fund is in place, she'll relax and look at you through a different set of eyes. This is one of two things I'm going to tell you today for those of you that are married or ever want to be married, that will revolutionize your marriage. Because she will feel completely different at that point. Not because she's weaker, because on money matters, a lot of times ladies are actually stronger, but because that's how she's wired on this subject. And she'll look at you in a different way when that emergency fund's in place. It's an investment in your marriage. An emergency fund turns a crisis into an inconvenience. If your transmission goes out and it's $2,700 to fix it, and you have $155,000, you go, Dad gum, transmission went out, that's a pain. If the transmission goes out and you were broke, you go, Oh God, the world's coming to my head. It changes your whole life. The drama starts to leave your life when you have this emergency fund stuff in place. It is absolutely powerful. That is baby step three. Now the baby steps take on a different flavor at four, five, and six. We're going to do them at the same time. So we're going to limit our investing here in four to only 15%, because I want to work on the other two baby steps at the same time. Instead of going 22 or 28 in savings, only 15% invested into Roth IRAs and 401ks. This is a mathematical explosion, that stuff we talked about where there's interest on the interest on the interest. Now, you've got a different kind of snowball rolling. It's rolling down the hill and you're chasing it instead of it chasing you. Now you get to see your money start to make you money. This is a plan right here. $100 a month invested from age 25 to age 65 at 12% in a decent growth stock. Mutual fund is $1,176,000. I just gave you a formula to be a millionaire. Straight up. Now 30 to 70 is the same numbers. 35 to 75 is the same numbers. $100 a month. That's pizza money in some of your houses. It's your cable bill. You know what I'm saying? You consume $100 in the lights. Then he's getting personal, and they're having, like, a withdrawal back there, caffeine thing happening. $100 bucks. $100. And you're a millionaire, every single month. Roth IRAs and 401ks are secret government formulas to wealth. Now, you don't have any payments but a house payment. Now, you can find $500 bucks. Let's do the numbers. Average household income is 4,175, or roughly 3K a month. That's what it is. Your take home pay is about $2,700 bucks. The average family making 40K has got a house payment of about $700. $2,700 take home minus a house payment of $700 leaves $2,000 bucks. You have $2,000 bucks to eat, pay lights, Oh, I don't have any debt payments. Maybe I could save $500 out of the $2,000. Could I? Yes. And then you might end up with some money in the process. This is real. I didn't just make this up today. We've done this for a long time, and it works. And see, here's what's interesting about those numbers. The Roth IRA grows tax-free, because it doesn't happen very often. This is Washington, and they're freaking parasites. So, tax-free is a good idea. It's very unusual. Now, let's think about it. $6,000 a year for 40 years. What's 6K times 40? 24. That's $240,000 that went in. Is this interesting? $240,000 went in, and it grew $5.8 million. So, out of $5 million, $800,000 of it you didn't put in. Wow. It's all growth. The whole thing is growth. It's the snowball adding snow. And the fact that it's tax-free is huge, because taxes on $6 million would look a lot like $1.6 million. Which means this word Roth is worth, in this example, somewhere around $400,000. Now, the 401k is a secret government formula to wealth because you do that investing pre-tax. You take $1,000 of your income and bring it home. By the time it gets home, it looks suspiciously like $700. But if you put it in pre-tax, the whole $700 plus your $300 you would have given to Congress goes in. Why is that important? Because $240,000 turns into $5.8 million. So, we want as many of these government dollars as we can gather up that would have gone to them earlier. We use them. They do a lot of heavy lifting. So every one of them is multiplied bazillions of times over. So every dollar I can keep in my hand to grow money with, with pre-tax investing, is genius. But the trick is, you need to start right now. Ben and Arthur illustrate that fact for us. 
Ben invests starting at age 19. He invests $2,000 a year in a good growth stock mutual fund all the way up until age 26. Ben puts in $16,000 for 8 years, $2,000 a year. That's $16,000. At age 27, he quits investing. It's not a trick question. And the money grows. And the money grows. His brother Arthur wakes up and says, Whoa, I've been dumb. I need to catch up. I'm going to start investing $2,000. He starts at age 27 and invests $2,000 a year from age 27 all the way to age 65. He puts $78,000 in, and then he never catches up. The guy who put in $16,000 beats the guy who put in $78,000 by $1,000. Some of you are going, that's a real NE chart if I was 19. You understand, if you gather this information, you put it in your brain, and it changes your heart and causes you to handle money differently for the rest of your life. This one section right here, this one chart, will make you a multi-millionaire. I just made you a millionaire if you got this. Now, let me just tell you. Some people say, am I too old to save money? Not if you're still sucking wind. Besides that, you can't go backwards. This is your only option. You can start where you are, and let's go. I'm 52. It's too late. So shoot yourself? I mean, what are you going to do? Let's go from here. We've got to go somewhere with this. I know people make the most money they've made in their lives in their 50s. Lots of people never do anything until they're 60. Colonel Sanders never fried chicken commercially until he was 67 years old. Grandma Moses never painted a painting until she was 84 years old. He did 1,500 works of art. 450 of them she did after age 100. Everything you know Winston Churchill for, he did in his 70s. Everything you know Golda Meir for, she did in her 70s. It's not over till you quit. But with the money thing, it's easier if you start now. Now we only put 15% of our income into retirement at Baby Step 4, because I wanted to save some money to start working on the kids' college fund. If you have kids and you want to do a kids' college fund, Baby Step 5 is where you do it. You don't do the kids' college fund while you're still in debt because you don't have any money. It's all going to payments. You don't use the emergency fund to send the kids to college. That's not an emergency. And by the way, when they go to college, they could learn to do something like work. It won't kill them. College funding makes sure the kids are fit too. An educational savings account, the Education IRA, is what it's nicknamed as. The ESA is like the Roth IRA for college. It grows tax-free. You're allowed to put $2,000 a year into this account. You put $2,000 a year into it, it will grow tax-free from 0 to 18. 2 times 18 is $36,000 went in. $36,000 went in, but you'll have about $126,000 in there at 12%. When they reach 18, that means you have somewhere around $90,000 in growth that you pay no taxes on. So, do this for your kids' college, the educational savings account, and good growth stock mutual funds. Take the time to research the cost of college. You need to think about that when they're little. You need to think about that as they get older. Some of you have kids that are 13, 14 years old right now. You haven't started saving for college, and so you're not going to have enough to pay cash for college. You don't have enough to pay cash for some big expensive private school unless you put them deeply in debt. Instead, you could do something like send them to a school you can afford. Oh, there's a thought. But see, we go crazy with the word education. We worship at the altar of the diploma in this culture. And let me tell you what. Your college degree is worth nothing. The knowledge that you got on the way to getting that degree, if it is applied in the marketplace, is the only thing that has value. Knowledge is the currency of this millennium. Knowledge is important. Continual learning is important. It's not over when you leave college. You need to read and do some other things continually to get better, like you're doing in here today. Continual learning is the only way you're going to win. Teach your kids that and think about what you're getting for what you're spending. Spending. I'm happy for you if you graduated from Harvard or Yale or Princeton. I am not putting those schools down. I'm not putting down Vanderbilt. But let me tell you what, if you're going to go there, you better be ready to pay for it. And if you're telling me it's worth going $100,000 in debt to go there, I can economically prove to you, you're an idiot. The average college student is graduating right now with $27,900 in student loan debt. This is crazy. And another $6,000 in credit card debt. By the way, first rule, college, pay cash. Now, we're sailing. We've got the retirement going. We've got the emergency fund in place, 
we're doing the kids' college into the educational savings account. Now every other dollar above that that we get coming in, put it on the house. Pay off the house, pay off the house, pay off the house, pay off the house. Think about it. What could you do if you had no payments? I mean, if you just take a house payment, put that puppy into a mutual fund every month. You know, quick, that's a million dollars really quick. You've been looking at these numbers all day long, you're beginning to see how this stuff works. I mean, what could you do if you had no payments? You'd have control of your most powerful wealth building tool, which is your income. That's the muscle of your ability to build things. Be wise. Keep my home mortgage because I get the tax deduction. How many of you have ever heard the tax deduction myth? I don't want to pay off my house. I'll lose my only tax deduction. That's one of the biggest ones. And I'm amazed that CPAs are so stupid and they do this really. I've got a degree in finance. Now take a tax deduction if you have one for goodness sakes. Don't send too much money to Washington. But staying in debt because of a tax deduction, here's how that works. Think about it for a second. If you had a $100,000 mortgage at 5% interest, that means the interest that you paid that year would be 5% of $200,000, which is $10,000. Now if you do that and you make $70,000 a year, and you have a $10,000 tax deduction, and you make 70, you don't pay taxes on 70, you pay taxes on 60. If that's the case, you're in a 25% tax bracket, you save $2,500 in taxes. A tax deduction mathematically, is sending the mortgage company $10,000 to save sending taxes of $2,500 to Washington. Here's an idea. Pay off your mortgage, give your church $10,000, and you get the exact same benefit. It's wise to borrow all I can on my home because I can invest it and make more on the investment. If I borrow money at 6.5% and I put it in a good mutual fund making 12%, am I not making a 5.5% spread? The answer is no. Because your little formula is naive out here in the real world where we all live. If you make 12% you're going to pay taxes on it, and your after-tax yield is 9.4%. And out here in the real world, if you're smart, you don't compare zero-risk investments apples to apples with risky investments. I got a 30-year mortgage, and I promised to pay it like a 15. You're lying to yourself. The truth is, no one does. Something will go wrong. It will rain every month. You know the interesting thing about a 15-year mortgage? They pay off in 15 years or less every time. You know how many times a 30-year mortgage pays off in 15 years or less, unless it's refinanced? 2% of them pay off systematically in 15. Nobody does this stuff. Everybody talks about it and thinks, Well, if I have a little problem, I'll have wiggle room that way. Well, your life is a little problem. That's what happens. 15-year mortgages pay off in 15 years. So here's the deal with a house. Only buy a home after baby step 3. You're debt free. You have the emergency fund. I recommend paying cash. You're crazy. It's hard. I don't borrow money. There is nothing on the planet I don't have enough to go back into debt. Ever. The borrower is slave to the lender. I got that okay? I got it all the way to the soles of my feet. I don't even want to have anything to do with a bank unless I'm buying it. That's simple. But if you're going to go get a house, never take out more than a 15-year mortgage. And never take out more than a 15-year mortgage, where your payment on a fixed rate is more than a fourth of your take-home pay. You're buying too much house. And if some rip-off loan shark, subprime greedy banker is going to stick you with a prepayment penalty, an adjustable rate mortgage, an interest-only mortgage, or a balloon payment, or with an above-market interest rate just because if I get a house, my life will be good, back off. You're not ready to buy yet. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How are we transformed? By the renewing of our minds. Transformed. Have a total money makeover. People don't get the best use of their money in half or at money problems for two basic reasons. Now, number one is ignorance. Don't get mad at me. You know I'm ignorant about some things. You don't want me doing brain surgery on you or fixing your car. In either case, there'll be parts left over. Ignorance is not a lack of intelligence. Ignorance is like know-how. I don't know how to do those things. I'm an intelligent guy, but I don't know how to do those things. You can do that. We can hire people to do brain surgery. You can hire them to work on your car, and I highly recommend it in both cases. But don't hire them to manage your money. You need to learn how to do this stuff. You can bring CPAs in to teach you. You can bring in an investment guy in the mutual funds to help you, a real estate gal over here, a good mortgage broker over here, an insurance person to teach you. 
But they all need to have the heart of a teacher, because all you're looking for is counsel. You're not looking for a babysitter. You're not looking for a daddy or a mommy because it's your job to manage your life. And the multitude of counselors, there's safety. You gather the information, but you make your decisions. Don't let someone else do that for you. Now we got the house paid off. Now the kids' college is underway. Now retirement's underway. See, when you get all that done, baby step seven. There's nothing left to do except build lots of wealth and give it away. You're going to have the most fun you've ever had with money when you hit baby step seven. When you launch into this area of wealth, you're going to look at things through a completely different lens that you didn't even know you had in your camera. It's a whole new way of seeing things. Your most powerful wealth building tool is your income. When you get control of that, it will launch you. And you don't have to be on the radio. You don't have to have best-selling books to do it. Regular people making $50,000, $60,000 a year do this stuff all the time. Wealth is not an escape mechanism. It is instead a tremendous responsibility. If you think your life's going to get better just because you get money, you're wrong because you become more of what you are. If you are a jerk and you get a bunch of money, you will become a very large jerk. If you're generous and charitable and you get money, you will have a huge impact on people around you. You'll never sit down in church next to a single mom who's crying because her light bill was due. But what you do is reach over and pay it to the end of the year. But you really don't do it right then. You do it after you get home so she doesn't know who did it. Because it was really God that did it. It wasn't you. You don't need to be taking the credit anyway. There's only three things you can do with money. You can have fun with it, you can invest it, and you can give it. And you need to do all three. You better be having some fun. Money's fun if you got some. You need to be investing it so you got some. And you need to be giving it because it is the most fun you'll ever have with it. Giving is possibly the most fun you'll ever have with money. That's the deal. You know Winston Churchill said, he said, We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. Andrew Carnegie, who was the Bill Gates of his day in the year 1900, Carnegie Steel, Carnegie Hall, and started most of the public libraries in America. Today the wealthiest guy of the year 1900 used to say that surplus wealth is a sacred trust to be managed for the good of others. If you bear with me for about two minutes and not move, this last section is very very important. There's two things I want to cover with you. One is this. Each of you is perfectly trained, perfectly designed four-cylinder engines. You need to run on all four cylinders to be able to win. We're physical beings. Take care of this. You get one. Don't go to McDonald's. Eat 62 Big Macs and go. They bless this for the nourishment of our bodies. Take care of this. You got one. Eat less. Exercise more. It's not hard. Just be cognizant of what you're putting in your mouth. People don't sneak in your bedroom in the middle of the night. Stuff food down your mouth. It's you. You're the one doing it. You know, I know it because I put the sign on my desk. It's the food, stupid. I know it's me. It's my job to take care of me. The second thing is we're emotional beings. If you've had something bad happen to you in your life, and most of us who are breathing have, you may need to sit down with your pastor or a good counselor and unpack your baggage. Life's too short to go through it with a Samsonite. It's heavy and scary. I came from a dysfunctional family. We all did. They have people in them. I'm not poking fun at you. I'm just saying I know what it means to hurt. And it's okay to get some help when you're hurting. It's kind of dumb not to. The third thing is this. We're intellectual beings. Feed your mind. Read, 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 read. The average person hasn't read a non-fiction book. 70% of Americans haven't read a non-fiction book since their last day of formal education. Charlie Tremendous Jones says that five years from today, you will be the same person you are today, making the same money you have today, with the same problems today, except for the books you read and the people you meet. Now, you can be an intellectual. You can feed your intellect and grow. You can take care of your body, and you can take care of your emotions. But if you do those three out of four, you are not running on 75% power until you plug in the fourth one. The other three don't work right. And when you plug it in, it takes you to more than 100% power. It takes you to zero power. It kicks in the joy. It kicks in the celebration of life. It kicks in the passion of life. It increases your creativity. It changes everything about the other three. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the spiritual. The step-by-step -step Baby Steps program is steeped in common sense biblical wisdom. It is an absolute process that is proven, literally, to date. Millions within a sea of Americans are somewhere in those baby steps. 
They're right now working this exact process. Millions and tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of dollars of debt, has already been paid off. Whether this stuff works is not in question. The only question that remains this evening is what you're going to do. Don't wake up five years from now and wish you changed your life. Go home this week and start. Do it right now. Say you will. Thank you, Dallas. You're awesome. While successful people are excellent communicators, so how do you communicate more effectively with others? Now the first principle is profound. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Words have the power to create or destroy, and a careless comment can alter a relationship forever. Therefore, it's essential to choose your words carefully and consider their impact before putting them out into the world. Before you speak or write, I want you to ask yourself these four questions. Is it necessary? Is it true? Is it kind? Is it helpful? If you don't get yeses to those questions, then don't say it. One observation I've made is that many people are careless with their language. The words you use either lift up your energy, make you more creative, or deny your talents. Think about the great dictators. Their words of hatred, toxicity, and breakdown caused terrifying acts. On the other hand, consider people like Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr., or Mother Teresa. They were careful with their words, lifting people up. Great leaders use the language of leadership. Your self-identity, income, and performance are influenced by your words. If you see yourself as average, you won't strive for greatness. Therefore, it's crucial to calibrate your language to be world-class. This leads me to the next critical skill, effective listening. Many of us are terrible listeners, but effective communication requires both parties to focus on listening as much as speaking. An invaluable tip for important conversations. Let the other person go first. Listen to their point of view. Be curious about their feelings and seek to understand. Sometimes, even when you listen closely, you may not hear exactly what the other person is trying to say. Therefore, it's essential to double check and ensure you understood them correctly before responding. Practice speaking up when necessary, as it's a gateway to the right relationships, whether personal or professional. Teach people to be articulate, as effective communication requires knowing more than you're talking about. Read your audience. There are a thousand individuals with different engagement levels. Adjust your communication accordingly. They look confused, interested, angry, or bored, and they give you feedback about how you're doing. The people I've observed in my life who have been spectacularly successful have skills. Clearly that's a minimum precondition, but they're also very, very good at articulating themselves. So whenever they negotiate, they're successful. They are quiet, self-contained, not particularly expressive. They're sensitive, people-oriented, and concerned about other people's opinions. If you're communicating with this person, it requires a slow, low-key, easygoing, friendly, almost warm and fuzzy approach. Now the third type of person is what we call the director. They achieve with and through other people. They like to talk about achievement. What are you doing? How did you do it? How did it work? Many times they become managers or executives because they have highly integrated personalities. They're very concerned about results, but they're also concerned about people. Everybody you meet is in one of these four quadrants or groups. The mistake that most people make is that they treat everyone else as if they were just the same as they were. However, no matter which style of communicator you are, three quarters of the people you meet are something else. Now there's no right or wrong, better or worse style. These are almost born into people. You can see them in children from an early age. However, your job in asking questions and listening to people is to find out which style they are, and then to practice personality flexibility, so that you can get along with a greater number of different types of people. Somebody's having a bad day and you don't know they're having a bad day, but somebody's really feeling bad, and you offer up a kind word, maybe it's just a friendly hello, how are you? Maybe it's just taking a minute or two to listen to what somebody has to say. But your few words of kindness or your few minutes of attention could turn somebody's day around might make them feel more worthwhile, cared for. Be generous with your kindness. It'll go a long way. When you give kindness, it's not gone, it's invested. It'll come back to you two, five, ten, a hundred times. Kindness. It's so important in every aspect of your life. It's so important in building good relationships with others. Most people won't reveal the problem on the first question. You say, Mary, how are you today? How are things? And she says, well, 
everything's okay. And you can tell by the way she said it that everything's not okay. And most of us don't want to come right out and say what the real problem is unless two criteria are met. Number one, we're talking to someone we can trust. And number two, we're talking to someone who really cares. So sometimes it takes that second question, maybe a third, and maybe a fourth before trust fills, and the person finally understands that you do care. Then they're willing to tell you what's really going on, what's really on their mind. Learn to ask questions that will build the trust and communication between you and those you work with. Learn to express, not impress. If you want to touch somebody, express sincerity from the heart. Impressing builds a gulf. Express builds a bridge. When you want to enhance the rapport you have with someone, you need effective communication skills. You'll need the skills that'll help you work better with others to achieve their goals and achieve your goals. You need effective communication skills. Let me give you a few tips on good communication. Because to be able to get along well with others, to be able to work well with others, to be able to live well with others, you must be a good communicator. Number one, have something worth saying. Interest, fascination, sensitivity, and knowledge. Number two, now that you've got something worth saying, number two is say it well. You've got to be able to translate it so it'll benefit someone. You must have a good delivery system for your substance and knowledge and awareness and understanding and experience. Learn to say it well. And here are some clues on saying it well. Number one, sincerity. The best communication occurs when both people are sincere, one sincerely wishing to learn or listen, and the other sincerely wishing to share. Number two, in saying it well, is repetition. Part of saying it well is simply practicing to say it well. Practice, practice, practice. You start with something simple, and when you don't know much about what you're doing, practice is even more important. So practice your presentation and your ability to communicate what you know. The people out there who say no, I wouldn't care for any, are just as valuable. Why? Because they took the time to let you practice your presentation. And especially when you're just getting started, you might want to pay them to listen to you practice while you stumble around. So be thankful for the no's. Practice helps you develop skills. Skills make labor more valuable. If you just sell, you can make a living. If you skillfully sell, you can make a fortune. If you just talk, you can hold a family together. If you skillfully talk, you can build dreams in the future. The difference is skill. You can cut a tree down with a hammer, but it takes about 30 days. If you trade the hammer for an axe, you can cut the tree down in about 30 minutes. The difference between the 30 minutes and 30 days is the tool. And your best communication tool is your skill. So practice to get the skill of saying it well. Part of saying it well is sincerity. Now here's another part of saying it well, brevity. Sometimes you don't need too much, just enough. The more you know, here's what I found out. The more you know, the briefer you can be because you can learn to make words more affected. Next is style. Part of saying it well is style. Be a student of style a variety of styles, then make sure you develop your own. Be a student, but develop your own. Don't be someone else. Let someone else influence you, but don't become them. Develop your own style. Here's another tip on saying it well. Vocabulary. You've just got to have a good vocabulary to say it well. Vocabulary. We can only translate for other people with the tools called vocabulary. If you're lacking in vocabulary, then you're lacking in tools to describe some problem or some answer. Words, vocabulary. You can't communicate without them. And you can't communicate well without a defined vocabulary. Every time you come across a word that's new to you, what should you do? Look it up. Every time you're in a conversation and the other person uses a word that's new to you, look it up. Now most of the time you can figure out the meaning of a new word by how it's used. But if you can't, make sure you hold your response until you know for sure. Vocabulary is a way of seeing. It gives us insight, and only with your present vocabulary can you see. You can't use tools you don't have to see. To create light, understanding, awareness, comprehension, perception, vision, you can only have as much vision as your present vocabulary will give you. And if you're limited in vocabulary, then you can't see very well. What if a person could only see the world through a little tiny hole? Now vocabulary is also what we use as a tool to express what's going on in our heart, what's going on in our head, translate our questions, translate our answers, our perceptions, what we see. To be able to say it, and I'm telling you, 
If you have a limited way of translating and expressing what's going on in your heart and what's going on in your head, you'll fall way behind. So you'd have twin problems without a good vocabulary. Number one, you wouldn't be able to see. Number two, you wouldn't be able to express. And your world would keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Not having the vision, not having the tools. Finally, you wouldn't need a place much bigger than 10 by 12 to live. Why? That's about as big as some people's world is. That's all they've got. This little narrow world, making mistakes every day because they can't see. Getting it wrong every day because they can't comprehend, they can't understand. No tools with which to translate. For good communication, number one is having something good to say. Number two is saying it well. And number three is reading your audience. You've got to read what's going on between you and the people you're talking to. Did you say what you're saying a little softer? Should you say it a little stronger? Should you explain it more? Should you be more clear and concise? Should you quit? A lot of the decision making that's going on during a conversation with someone depends on how well you can read, how well you can tell what's going on in the minds of those you're trying to reach. It doesn't matter if you're looking into the face of a child or the face of a colleague or a thousand faces in an audience. You've got to read what's going on. You've got to pay attention. So let me give you some ways to read. The first one is, you've got to read what you see. You've got to read what you see. Search the face of a child and see if you're coming across. See if they look perplexed. See if they're getting it. See if they can't get it. Body language tells us a lot. Look at how the people you're talking to are sitting. What they are doing with their hands, their eyes. The guy's got his arms crossed, legs crossed, chin tucked down, and frowning. You've got your work cut out for you. This guy's not going to be easy to reach. The lady's standing up from behind her desk. You've got to hurry. She's not going to listen to much more. You've probably got to pick up the pace and get down to it. So the first one is read what you see. Here's the second one. Read what you hear. You've got to be a good listener to be a good communicator. Get some feedback. Listen. To be a good parent, you've got to be a good listener. To talk well, you've got to listen well. That's so valuable. Get the feedback. Now what you hear may help you change gears. Be a little stronger. Be a little softer. Find a different illustration. This one isn't working. Search for another way to say it. Become sensitive to someone else's words. Not just by preparing to talk when the other person's through. Listen. Pick up those signals that the feedback of words gives us. Now here's the third way to read your audience. And that is to read how you feel. Emotional signals. You've got to learn to pick those up. Pick up those feelings. Women just seem to have this part built in. Men can learn it, but women have it. Woman says, it doesn't feel right, just doesn't feel right. Man says, what does that mean it doesn't feel right? She says, it's something, he says something, something. What is this something? She says, I'm telling you, something doesn't feel right. Now men can learn it, but women have it. Learn to read your emotion. Learn to read what others are feeling so you can adjust your communication. So you can adjust your approach. So you can get your message across. So you can communicate well.